Welcome to the Library of the History of Human Imagination. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I was looking forward to meeting and spending time talking about health and medicine and specifically a, a wide range of topics. But I can't help but start. We were chatting earlier and you told me that you're in this business of your world because of your mother. That's right. Uh, uh, years ago, my mother, uh, she was one of the real original pioneers, I think, in the computer business. and started a business when, in the 60s and uh, doing data entry, if you can imagine, key punching. And all of our, all the kids grew up uh, learning the computer business from her. And so yeah, she's, she's the driving force. Privacy is the flip side of sort of data security. Mm -hmm. Is there an opportunity for a new discussion about privacy, especially in the context of big data, when we can collect a lot of information and save lives with aggregated data, but at the same time we have sort of a 19th century view to privacy, which is, this is mine and leave me alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's the, there's the shift that we need to make as people to realize that, you know what, there is, a, there is a chance that some of this information may come out. But there's also a lot that can be done with technology to sort of depersonalize data. Mm -hmm. There's no reason that you can't aggregate data and depersonalize it. You know, you don't have to know the person's social security number or their exactly. everything about them. You can capture the important, the name isn't, isn't as important as the underlying data. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, yeah. many people say that the attitude towards data nowadays is more a function of the age of the person you're talking to. Mm -hmm. Has that been true not just, it's true in a patient sense, has it been true in, in the sense of when you approach doctors and practices in your world where when they're run by younger people they're much more embracing of the upside of automation and the benefits? Have you seen that in the actual yeah. marketplace? Yeah, I think so. That isn't to say there aren't some right. really progressive people uh, you know, that, that have been in the industry for a while, but I think it, like it is, in, you know, my, uh, I have 13 grandkids and I gave each of them an, an iPad for Christmas, right. and including the, t the two that are two years old. Right. And the little two-year-old came over and said, I got one too, <laughs> and was immediately, immediately you know, it. working it. So yeah, I think that trend of, of the younger you are, the easier it is to understand that uh, the, 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 the upside of, of uh, data and, and access. But, uh, you know, I think people, in the, the, there are progressive people in, in, in all fields right now that are right. saying, you know what, whatever the old paradigm was, we've really got to, we've got to change because the data itself, it has, you know, there's gold, there's, there's so much knowledge there that we have to set aside some of those conservative concerns that we have. I think one of the great challenges we face in, in health and medicine is that there's a sense of balkanization in many cases of these data sets where mm -hmm. you know each hospital system, each insurer, they have their data sets mm -hmm. and there really isn't an enormous benefit in opening up your data set right. you know, with other data sets and so we end up, if you will, with a best practices evolution inside a data set mm -hmm. but nothing between the data sets. Is, is that something you think is just a transitional phase we're going through and that's going to come down or is that something that could get worse? I think it's the same, the same phenomenon that you talked about with an individual wanting to hold their data, right? right. And don't, don't, you know, I'm scared, don't let anybody see this or the risk of me sharing it, I mean, you know, somebody might find it. Uh, I think that and then the, the phenomena of a, of a, of a provider or payer, for example, who has, or a provider, a hospital chain that has tremendous information. The, the thing that will motivate the person to begin to surrender some of that sort of right. tight hold yeah. will be, you know what, the, some good came from this. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, I, I saw that my stuff helped these little kids or whatever, right. whatever the example was. I think that there will be a different motivation from the, uh, from the provider or the payer mm -hmm. and it'll be if I open up and if I share this data and we have a larger universe, my ability to predict and to make better decisions will increase. Because there, there's very much an argument right now where people will say, I have a big enough data set. Right, and that happens all too often, I yeah. suspect. Yeah, and that's, that's the number one. When we talk about aggregating data, the main pushback is really, well, 
already have a huge, huge amount of data. So that means the data analytics are going to get, have to get a lot better to be able to say, yeah, we're now talking about, we're not- This tiny we're, cohort. Yeah, we're not, you may have a giant data set, but you only have 11 people in that cohort, right. and that's you need right. another 50 in that cohort, so. And if we do that, then we can improve the outcome by X. Tell me what else you see. On the patient side, any big drivers that are going to change the game? I think the, getting the patient more involved in their care mm -hmm. and, under, and understanding and sort of taking ownership of it. You know, you think about a primary care physician and say, okay, well, one of the things that they need to do is manage and oversee the care of that individual. And that's absolutely vital, and I, and I hope we see more, you know, a right. stronger trend in that direction. But if we can do things where people you know, on their iPad or their smartphone are able to say, you know, hey, this, this is my history, this is what, and I, and I need to do these things, and, and begin to have people feel more ownership in the healthcare rather than saying, well, that's the, the doctor. Not that, not that they want to do care, but, right. but being responsible for their own, uh, you know, understanding their health history and being responsible. Uh, I, I just think back on, on uh, it's like taking Coumadin, okay? Right. If you take Coumadin, you're supposed to go in every, you know, couple of weeks to and, have you, and yeah. have you, otherwise it can be really, it's you know, negative, drug, right? yeah. negative. And I remember the first time that I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and about six doctors came in and said, listen, let me explain to you the consequences of if you don't do that. And suddenly I, I started to keep track to say, oh, it's been two weeks, it's been this, it's been, and so instead of it being, you know, the clinic having to call and say, did you get your test done? I took ownership of that. At TEDMED, we often talk about the importance of imagination as a tool to improve health and medicine. Mm -hmm. um, you're in a world where you're literally trying to bring technology, bring business process improvements, uh, an engineering-driven, ROI, bottom line, CapEx world. Mm -hmm. Imagination have a role in that process? Uh, absolutely. In fact, uh, we, we're fortunate to have a, an organization. I, I use PARC as the, right. as the, it's the that's the generic term because we have many of these labs. It's so fun to go and sit down with these people who I think, they don't think anything about the, the stuff that I think about. Right, it's old news. And yet you say, well, what do you think about this? And they, uh, their imagination, their creative, their ability to do research and to think, um, not think the way I, you know, I think, like you said, in terms of P&Ls and earnings, and that's all important. You know, it kind of helps keep, right. keep things, keep, keeps the machine going, but to have people who are really creative. And you know, we, one of the fun things that, that we've had in, in terms of being part of Xerox was that they had these laboratories and we were able to take business problems and say, you know, how, would you do uh, how do we solve this parking issue, right? <laughs> and you have somebody who's a nuclear physicist, you know, <laughs> says, well, you know, how about this, right? Mm -hmm. Completely out of the box thinking and it's it's fun and the absolute I think that's the uh, we, imagination is the key to the whole thing so as you and your organization had joined the TED Med community how is does a community of people from across all fields of health and medicine in a hundred different areas how does that help you and your organization be more successful I think it it uh, goes straight back to the discussion that we've been having, and that is that uh, you know, we talked about people looking at issues who don't have, they don't have the same reference point that you have, and they come up with completely new ways of solving problems. And for us to be able to be a part of the thought leadership, and I, and I know that gets used a lot, but I think in the case of TED Med, it's, per, it's perfectly appropriate. And for us to be part of that and be able to uh, piggyback on these the great brains that are that are part of this uh, this organization it's just a 
uh, nothing but positive for us. Well, trust us, we learn as much from you. You know, business processes, uh, an area dear to my heart, uh, I actually have spent a fair part of my life in business processes, so you know, people don't tend to think of business processes as something powerful and inventive, mm -hmm. but as you know fully well, uh, an improved business process can, can create quality of care improvements that are massive for the amount of few, the dollars invested. And, and I'm sure you see it over and over again where doctors are just amazed about, wow, this process is just so much better. Yeah. I think one of the, the ways to, to obviously to make uh, health care more accessible, to, to be able to provide it to more people uh, is within the financial constraints that we have is to fundamentally change the business process. And it's things in the background that, as you say, people don't even, they don't even think about it. Uh, but it's a huge part of the cost, and, and uh, not only in terms of money, but it, it's, it's the efficiency that the yeah. provider experiences. So, um, yeah, we think it's important. Do you think that there's a big divergence between what the medical community thinks they spend in time and effort and money on administration and what the patient community thinks is actually being spent on time, money, and administration. Absolutely. How big is that gap? Oh, I think, I think it's, there's a gap in the, even within the providers themselves. They, I don't think they, they fully appreciate how much of their time gets spent in administrative things because any time that we've done a study, it's, it's pretty shocking to the people who we study. Right, we spend that much time we, not I, dealing I, with patients? Yeah, that's right. I had no idea I spent that. So I think there's a, there is a gap there, and that's a big opportunity for us, right, if right. we can make that efficient, uh, because that's, found, that's just found time, right? If somebody doesn't really realize how much they're spending and then you free it up, it's, wow. Well, it's a data analytic. You know, ironically, a time and motion study in an industrial setting is the classic way to measure the industrial efficiency. Mm -hmm. For many doctors, if they actually did a time and motion study, you're telling me they'd be amazed at they'd how much amazed. time they spend in completely non-health delivery tasks. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have ethnographers who, who essentially do that. Right. And, and we've sent them in to provider communities and said, okay, let's look at, from, as a scientist, right. let's look at what, what does a nurse do, mm -hmm. right? And what, have, what part of that is administrative and, and what part is actually providing care? And it's, it's a phenomenal uh, percentage. And, we have a thing called digital nurse, and that's the, the whole idea is how can we eliminate that, that non-medical piece and, and make them more efficient. So I think there's, there is a, uh, a gap within the provider community. And then I think on the patient side, who the heck knows, right? I mean, what do you think about your, your doctor? What's he doing? You know, why is, why is why he Why am I filling out the same forms right. every time I go to a, a different doctor? Where, where, how come? Why? Why? I, basically, I don't think of that as administrative work. I think of that as just telling him about me. Mm -hmm. But really, I'm performing administration. Mm -hmm. Every time I pick up a pen and I fill out a form, I'm performing an administration yeah. function. It's just been off offloaded to you rather Yeah, than exactly. Than They've it. just found a, a cheaper worker. <laughs> exactly. <me. laughs> okay? exactly. As opposed to somebody with a pen yeah. interviewing me. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, that, but that, that, but that thing that you wrote out, somebody somewhere has key to punch. take that and key punch it. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, you know, that's a lot of time. A lot of time. And, mis and mistakes that get entered. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's so you're hopeful in a lot of ways, is what I'm hearing you say, that the ACA can drive uh, some significant improvements both in the underlying drivers of what is motivating us and in the quality as well as in the efficiencies that we need. Mm -hmm. you're, you're reasonably hopeful. I am, I am. And, and uh, again, I, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in alignment of incentives. It's worked so far. Mm -hmm. I believe it's gonna to work tomorrow. Well, Lynn, thank you very much, and I appreciate very much you joining us today, and we're thrilled to have you as part of the TED Med community uh, with us. And uh, again, I look forward to chatting with you more and learning more. Thanks, Jay, it's been wonderful, thank you. Thank you.